All right, welcome everyone to the inaugural GW School of Medicine and Health Sciences, Journal and Drug and Dermatology, Dermatology Translational Lecture Series. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful. Um, I'd like to thank our sponsors, Exceltus and Intraderm, uh, for enabling us to put on this, this uh, program. We're very fortunate for our very first lecture to have uh, the world famous Dr. Gil Yosipovich, who is a professor of dermatology at the Miller School of Medicine at the University of Miami, and is the director of the Miami Itch Center. Uh, Dr. Yosipovich uh, is a world leader in itch research and clinical duties. Uh, he actually founded the first itch center in the United States when he, during his tenure at Temple University as chairman of the department. He has published over 300 papers, numerous textbooks, lectures pretty much every other week. He is a teacher, a scientist, a physician. Uh, Dr. Scott Norton told me if I didn't mention he is the Michael Phelps of itch, uh, he'd come after me. Uh, so without further ado, I welcome Dr. Gil Yosipovich. Oh, thank you, Adam. Oh, my God, I'm, uh, what a title. I hope I won't drown, uh, but um, it's really a great pleasure to uh, attend here uh, your uh, grand rounds and the inaugural uh, JDD uh, presentation here. And uh, it's uh, uh, something that uh, I uh, have a, a passion in uh, talking about itch. So, uh, I have to thank also Scott Norton for a wonderful dinner yesterday. So what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to discuss a bit um, itch uh, uh, from a clinical standpoint with incorporating uh, also some of the basic signs that we do. And I have to uh, mention all these uh, conflict of interest. I clearly will discuss off-label use because uh, I, we don't have yet any antipyretic drugs in the market, but the good news is, except antihistamines that don't work in most cases, but in uh, the next five years, there will be drugs in the market that will be itch specific. So it's an exciting time. And I think that it's um, all uh, two and four animal, legged animals are, are uh, itchy in the course of their life. And, what is itch about? It's basically a response to a threat we scratch away. But most of the time we think of itch as part of eczema and other skin diseases such as psoriasis, uh, urticaria, and uh, bullous pemphiguate and continuous T cell lymphoma. But do remember as dermatologists that there are systemic disease involved in chronic itch. And that's the basis of all uh, my work is, is really better understanding uh, uh, pathophysiology of itch and different uh, skin diseases and as well as systemic. Uh, but remember also that there are neuropathic types of itch, which I'll discuss today briefly. And uh, Scott mentioned to me, am I going to talk about psychogenic causes? You'll have to invite me for another talk because um, that's a totally different area, very interesting. Um, it's not just delusions of parasitosis, uh, it's also related to a lot of other psychiatric aspects. And actually, um, nowadays we know that um, also fibromyalgia is, is uh, uh, not just pain, but a lot of times chronic itch, uh, obsessive compulsive disorders, and substance abuse. So chronic itch uh, is defined by the International Forum for the Study of Itch that I founded with my colleagues from Germany uh, way back 10 years ago as chronic itch that lasts more than six weeks. And interestingly, it affects about 13.5% of the population. And so it's a big public health issue. And um, uh, my colleague uh, from UCSF, a, um, have uh, done a uh, analysis of data from the U.S. 17 million, 1% uh, of doctor visits in the U.S. are itch related. Clearly it destroys quality of life and it's much as chronic pain. So I think the first lesson I learned and I started my interest in uh, itch uh, as a resident was to listen to the patients and one of the first studies I've done in itch was to develop a questionnaire that was based on uh, a pain questionnaire called the McGill pain questionnaire and I learned a lot from the patients. It's always important to listen to them um, and as much as I like the basic science uh, aspect of the research, I think the best ideas I got is from my patients. So I learned a lot about uh, the severity, the characteristic of itch, and um, in the questionnaire we also assessed mood, 
affective dimensions, um, in daily activities that affect itch. Uh, clearly, uh, sleep is uh, a significant component. Uh, one of the issues that uh, not so good news for you guys is the older we get, for me especially, that I'm getting older, is that age is an important factor. The older we get, the more a higher chance we'll get um, chronic itch. Um, it, this is a study we've performed in uh, Hispanic geriatric subjects in the age of above 65. They were in nursing homes and in geriatric clinics. They weren't demented, no Alzheimer, uh, but um, they had a 25% point prevalence of chronic itch. There was a significant correlation to skin dryness varicose veins, lower leg uh, itch uh, is a, a major issue. And interestingly, scalp itch. You, you, I'm quite sure you see in your clinic sometimes old age folks uh, complaining of itch. Ask about diabetes because we found an association with diabetes and it could be possibly a neuropathic type of itch. Um, one of the simple tools, and I, I want some take home messages uh, for today, and this is something that I um, would hopefully uh, uh, predict that uh, in the next 10 years we'll have it in the EMR, in the electronic medical records. Hopefully you won't be mad at me because I think it is an easy tool to implement. This is something that I implemented in Temple. It's a um, NRS, a numerical rating scale, to better understand what is the severity of itch. Because it's not enough that we ask the patient, how severe is your itch? And he says, severe. But it's good to um, quantitize quantify that and we've implemented it in our EMR, very simple thing to do and you just press a button and we learned a lot about the severity of each of different types. Uh, just recently, just this week uh, with my colleague Sufi Chen, uh, we, um, she validated a new tool of this picture of uh, smiley faces uh, versus a sad one. In comparison, this has been used in pain and this tool could help in kids most probably um, a way to um, assess the severity of itch because uh, they're not so good in numbers. I'm speaking about the younger folks. But this is a demographic data that will be presented, I think, uh, will be published this uh, month, uh, September in JAD, is data that we collected from 600 patients that came with chronic itch. And what you can see again is that above the age of 65, there's significant more itch than the younger folks in terms of itch intensity. There are no differences be in gender. Some of my colleagues in Germany think that women rate itch higher. And uh, in regard to race, um, apparently African Americans uh, statistically more significantly rate itch uh, uh, in comparison to other groups. Uh, so I, I think there are differences in the general population of itch intensity. As I, may, as I mentioned, itch has a significant impact on quality of life. And patients with chronic itch, almost all types of chronic itch, have higher level of sleep related problems. And um, the majority state that the itch intensity uh, intensifies at nighttime. Um, and I thought that a picture is worth a thousand words. This had a big, big impact on my work. Um, this is work of uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Ibada from Japan, and his fellow, who then became my fellow, Yozo Ishuju. Um, did video imaging, infrared video imaging, uh, this was in 1999, it's the first study looking at how the patients with atopic eczema itch at nighttime. A picture is worth a thousand words in this case, and it had a big impact on me understanding a lot of times why patients uh, mention a lot of times they didn't feel, uh, they didn't remember scratching themselves at nighttime, but it, uh, in the morning they woke up with scratch marks and excoriations. And apparently in non-REM sleep, especially in the stage, the first initial stage of non-REM sleep and the third cycle, uh, this is an article we recently published, is when are of a significant impact of um, the itch is on sleep. So clearly when you don't sleep well, uh, it causes more stress, anxiety, and sometimes in extreme cases, even suicidal and, uh, thoughts and clearly depression. Uh, I, for years, have uh, been trying to promote this concept that chronic itch is a disease state 
on its own right. Um, and I think this is something that we as the profession uh, should address because a lot of our patients, they want to get a treatment for chronic itch. And we usually would tell them, okay, we'll treat your eczema, we'll treat the skin inflammation, but we did not address well these issues of the symptom itself. So I think this is one of the part of this international form for the study of itch that we founded. And I, and I think most of you will agree with me that antihistamines in most cases do not work for chronic itch. One of the issues that I, I see as interesting is that the phenotype of chronic itch is different. So a lot of times residents come to me and say, oh, the patient has uh, proigonodularis or lichen simplex, uh, lichen efficacy, but these are secondary skin changes. So not every patient who has severe itch has to have parigo lesions. And another issue is or like an efficacy. So you can have a patient with horrible itch, but they don't have these signs. But one of the issues that I was very much intrigued is, are there any differences in body areas in the itch perception, as well as the pleasurability of scratching an itch? And indeed, we looked at the study inducing itch in ankle, and back and forearm. Forearm is the site that most of the drug trials are using because it's easy to do. And apparently, actually, the back and, and the ankle are the most itchiest, uh, more than the forearm, and also pleasurable. The pleasurability of scratching an itch in the ankle and upper back is way above uh, the forearm. And this was funded by NIH, by the way, and I remember <laughs> that it caused a lot of media. Someone says, this is that public money. Uh, what do they spend on? But actually, I think this, uh, it was part of also a brain imaging study. But what I, I want to mention is that this actually explains why you see lichen simplex chronicus in areas like the ankle and back. I always thought the back was the most uh, itchiest uh, just because we know about back scratchers. Uh, but apparently the ankle is a very common site for lichen simplex chronicus. So in terms of possible mechanisms, we think that, and we did brain imaging of uh, itch induction, different body sites, and we think that there are differences not in the innervation. Um, the number of nerve fibers actually in the ankle is a lot less than in the forearm. As well, in the back, it's less than in the forearm. But apparently there's some central mechanisms that are involved in reward of scratching an itch in these areas. And another area that we're looking into is that tactile C nerve fibers can transmit pleasure. And they're located in these areas. So I think this will have more impact than just itch. It has an impact also on cosmetic companies. But I'd like to mention also that itch intensity different in different types of itch. So this is using our um, uh, computerized uh, numerical rating scales with the EMR. And I, uh, I thought that I learned a lot from that. Perigonodularis is number one um, severity of itch in 8.7 is severe itch considered, uh, followed by paritis of undetermined origin. I mean, there's a lot of times idiopathic itch, we don't know why. Um, and also, the older we get, the itch intensity goes up, as I mentioned. Uremic paritis have higher itch, and of course, atopic dermatitis. Um, neuropathic paritis is very high. All of these are significantly high intensities, and clearly we need to address them. 